Hello and welcome back to another past paper walkthrough, this time paper two for October, November 2023. This is for IGCSE and all level computer science from Cambridge, and this is the first part. The second part will be the 15 mark coding question, which I will leave for another video. Okay, as you're aware, you will be sitting two papers. Both papers take an hour and 45 minutes. Both papers have a 50% weighting, and both papers are worth 75 marks. Remember topic two, is generally the algorithms, programming, and logic, and this is for topics seven to 10, whereas paper one was for topics one to six. Just a reminder that calculators will not be allowed for either of these papers, okay? This is the sort of thing you're gonna get. Okay, remember, use a black or blue pen, use um, HB pencils for diagrams, no erasable pens or correction fluid on the paper. And these were the grade boundaries for this particular year, November 2023. As you can see, we're looking at component two, 75 marks. Um, if you were to be getting over 44 out of 75, we'll be looking at an A. Remember, this is a raw mark. Um, an A star doesn't exist when we're just talking about single components. For an A star, we would be looking here, where we combine paper one and paper two. And out of 150, we would be looking at marks over 103. Okay, so not too difficult. We're looking at about 70%, 69-70% to get an A star for this particular pairing of papers. Okay, let's get started. Question one. Tick one box, only one box, to show which operation means less than or equal to. Well, it's not or. B is less than, the less than sign. C is less than or equal to and D is greater than or equal to. So we're looking for less than or equal to, so that would be box C. Okay, nice and easy to get started. Question two, tick one box to show how a value can be passed to a procedure. We've got a function, a parameter, a return, and a subroutine. Well, both um, a function and a subroutine are both procedures, are both are similar to a procedure. So it leaves us with parameter or return. Well, return is, is, is not part of it at all. So it must be a parameter. In programming, passing a value to a, to a procedure um, with a parameter involves providing a value to the per parameter when calling the procedure. Um, different programming languages may have different syntaxes. Basically in Python, we would define something like define my function, but then in parentheses, we would put a parameter after it, and then we would print the parameter. So it would be a parameter. Question three, four descriptions of data and five data types are shown. Draw one line to link each description to the most appropriate data type. Not all data types have been used. Okay, well, a whole number is what's known as an integer. Okay, whereas a single letter is a character. A word or phrase would be a string. And the number with two decimal places we would call that a real number, okay? In Python, you call it a float, whereas you can see there, float isn't on there, we would call it a real number. Boolean is basically a yes or no answer, and they that doesn't apply in any of the descriptions. That would be the way to do it. Question four, no, whizzing through these. Question four, circle the three words representing places where data may be stored. Now, data can be stored in an array, absolutely, definitely. It can be stored in a can be stored in a constant. Dimension, no. Input, output, no. A procedure, no. A procedure is what we do. And a variable. So there would be the three: an array, a constant, and a variable. The constant might be the one that throws you, because data would already generally be stored in that, and it's data that can't be changed. Such as the constant might be days of the week, months in a year. Okay, where it's where it's fixed, but it is still storing data. Okay, so an array, a constant, and a variable would be my three answers there. The first stage of a program development lifecycle is analysis. Two of the tasks in analysis are abstraction and decomposition. Okay, what is meant by abstraction? Okay, and I'm assuming here we move on to decomposition later on. Abstraction generally means focusing on the important stuff. We, we make a plan to tell us what our program needs to do and how it will work without worrying about every single line of code. We're basically we're creating an overview. So abstraction is like zooming out and, and looking at the overall idea or plan. 
okay, looking at the big picture. So it's focusing of the essential and ignoring irrel irrelevant detail. For example, if you were to describe a bird, you'd say it has got a beak, it has got two wings, two eyes, two feet. Okay, and based on the wings and the beak, you would know that it's a, it's a bird. But that could be a duck, it could be a parrot, it could be any number of different types of birds. A penguin, it would still be a bird. Okay, we don't have to go on to what color it is, whether the feet are webbed, whether it's got a bill rather than a beak, how long its wingspan is. We just focus on the specific detail. So we're going to simplify the problem. Okay, and that would be it. Two marks. Three marks, identify three of the component parts when a problem has been decomposed at the analysis stage. In this case, we need to know what are the inputs, okay? What data, what data is gonna be coming into the program? What we're gonna do with that data, i.e. the processes, what tasks, and then outputs. What do we hope to get from the program once we've received the data, once we've received the inputs, okay? Do, question, do we need to store any data, okay? Storage. C, identify and describe one other stage of the programming development life cycle. What I'm gonna do with this, I'm gonna draw it out for you. We've got number one, which would be defining, define problem, okay? Then we move on to what we're talking about here, number two, problem analysis. We move on to number three, algorithm development. Number four, we'll be coding. Number five, would be testing and debugging. Finally, number six would be maintenance. Okay, once the program has been launched. Okay, so they would be our six. So you basically can pick any of the, any of those. So if we were to say, so if we were to say three algorithm development, designing a solution. Okay, and that would be it. And then we move on to question six. Okay, question six. We've got an algorithm. An algorithm has been written in pseudocode. We've got 21 lines of code there, declaring A, declaring T, declaring C and L, and all sorts of things, some for loops in there. So A, state the purpose of this pseudocode algorithm for one mark, and B, state four processes of in this algorithm. Okay, well, what I've done, because with it being all letters, it does make things a little bit complicated. So I've tried, I can show you here, I've tried to break it down so I can talk you through it a bit better. And you can pause the video if you want and have a look and see what you think. So let's start. We're going to declare A, which is a, a, an array, a list, and there's going to be 10 items in the list. So it's, and it's going to be declared as a string. So this must be where we're going to save something. If look at line six, please enter name. This is probably going to be where we're going to save some stored names. So let's have a little look. This declares an array, A, called A, with 10 elements, each capable of holding a string. Okay, string, one to 10. Declare T as a string. Okay, this declares a temporary variable called T to hold string values temporarily during sorting and I'll come to temporary in a minute in a moment three declare C and L C L as integers okay so declare two integer variables C and L L has been assigned the value 10 L equals 10 this assigns the value 10 to variable L indicating the length of the array okay how many items are in the array the first for loop line five the first for loop c has been assigned the value one to l so this loop iterates from one to ten okay because l has been assigned the value ten inside the loop it prompts the user to enter names in each element of array a okay so we're going to input please enter names so it's going to output a message please enter names and it's going to input them Okay, and because it's a for loop from one to 10, it's gonna do this 10 times. Okay, so that's the first for loop. The second for loop, the outer loop, okay, for C equals one to L, yeah, here. 
this loop iterates from 1 to 10, okay, as we've just seen here. But inside the loop, the inner for loop, yeah, inside the for loop, there is another for loop, yeah, from 1 to 9. In this inner for loop, 4L for equals 1 to 9, yeah, which we've just put in here, this loop iterates from 1 to 9, yeah. Inside this loop, though, this is the important bit, inside this loop, it compares adjacent elements of the array A, so names that are next to each other, yeah, and swaps them if they are in the wrong order. So if A L is greater than A L plus one, so the one next, the next one in the in the list, then T, yeah, the temporary string, has been assigned the value A L. So let's have a little look at this. So sorting, okay. If A L is greater than A L plus one, then if the string at position L in the array is greater than the string at position L plus one, then swap the two elements. Okay, and then finally, the last for loop, okay, down here, for C equals one to L. So C has been assigned, I'm using arrows and equals, but it's basically the same thing. C has been assigned the value one to L. This loop iterates, again, from one to 10, because L has been assigned the value 10. Output the name, Okay, C is AC. So, again, it's a follow-up. This loop iterates from 1 to 10. Inside the loop, it outputs each element of the sorted array A. So it's going to input all, so it's going to output, yeah, output all the names in the correct order because we've just used this bit, yeah, for sorting them into the correct order. Okay, so here we go. Sorts them into the correct order. So it's basically implementing a sort of a, a bubble sorting algorithm where it's sort of looking at the the, the adjacent values in the list, okay, and, may, and putting them into the correct order, okay. So that's me sort of breaking down this pseudocode, making it a little bit easier to read. Obviously, and I think it comes later in the question, using single letters for your variables and your arrays doesn't really help. It gives you sort of an idea of, of why we shouldn't use single letters for arrays, constants, variables. Okay, so let's move back onto the question. State the purpose of this, this pseudocode algorithm, which is to sort a list of 10 names into ascending order. State four processes in the algorithm. Processes. Okay, well, obviously, the, we've got, um, if we look here, we've got a, uh, an input process. The process of inputting the names. Okay, I'm just going to put an arrow to that. Inputting the names. Down here we've got a sorting process. Yep. Then we've got, and we could argue down here, we've got a um, swapping. So although it's sorting, yeah, it still got this, it's, it still needs to swap these elements. So within the sorting process, within here, look, then, yeah, within here, there is a specific process for swapping elements. When two adjacent elements are found to be in the wrong order, they are swapped using the temporary T. This ensures that the array is properly sorted. So this is why we've declared on line two the temporary, a T for temporary, there's your clue, for the swapping process. And then finally, down at the bottom here, we've got an output process. All these are little procedures within this code, the little processes within this code. So that's what I would do there. And it just says state. So that's all we need to do. Okay, so that's A and B for five marks. C, meaningful, and this is what I was talking about, meaningful identifiers have not been used in the algorithm. Suggest suitable meaningful identifiers. Well, A is the array. So what, what, what are we storing in the array? I'm going to call this a name, names array. T, I'm going to call this temp name. Okay, for temporary names. And then we've got C and L. C is normally counter. In the case of here, for C, we're going to assign 1 to L, so we're going to use that as a counter. Yeah. And L, well, L, the clues in the question, is the the length of the string. We've got 10 characters. Yeah, L has been assigned a value of 10, so I'm going to put L as the length, the, the length of the array, the size of the array. Okay, so we're trying to keep the names for A, T, C, and L. 
State two other ways the algorithm can be made easy to understand and maintain. Well, we know this. Um, it should be comments. Comments within the code to help explain its purpose. Okay. The next bit we could break this down into smaller parts. We could use decomposition and break and break it down into procedures or functions. So I'm going to use something called modularization. Okay. Break down into smaller parts, e.g. functions, procedures. Okay, so that's what I would do. Modularization and add comments. Okay, so that's it for question six. Question seven, consider the logic circuit. Let's just label these. I've got not gate, not, I've got another not, I've got an and, and I've got an or gate. So we need to come up with an expression. Okay, write a logic expression for the logic circuit. Do not attempt to simplify this logic expression. So we've got not A and B. So let's look at this. Not A and B. I've got or, and because B and C are not connected, or not C. Okay, so that is what I've got. Three points. I've got, yeah, not A and B or not C. Okay, but I want to write this um, into a proper expression. I'm just going to write this out. So not A and B or not C. And what I would do is I'd put that in brackets like so. I could put both in brackets, but it doesn't really matter. B. So let's have a little look, work through the truth table. Complete the truth table from the given logic circuit. We've got to work out what the output is, what X is going to be. I'm going to put X in here. Okay. A, B, and C are all turned off. So let's add some more letters. I'm going to add D to this. Okay. And we'll see what happens. So D can be here. Okay. And I'm going to put E here, which is basically going to be the opposite of um, C. Okay. So if C is 1 here, then obviously um, 0 would come out of it because it's a NOT gate because a NOT gate is also known as an inverter. So every time C appears as a zero, it's gonna be inversed as a one. So zero there. So yep, 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 yep. Okay, D and E are going into an OR gate. Okay, so because that's an OR gate, because E is turned on, that's gotta be a one. That's got to be a 1, that's got to be a 1, and that's got to be a 1. Okay, but let's try and work out if there's any more 1s among this. So we need to work out D has got two things going into it. Yeah, so not A and B. So let's have a look. So B needs to be on, B needs to be on here, B's on here, and B's on here. But we need A to equal 0 because it's going to equal 1 when it comes through there. So every time A is 0 there, but B is 0 as well, A is 0. So here, that would flip, so that would be OK. So that's good. But here, with that being 0, that must be a 0. OK, so let's have a look at this one. We flip that around. So that that's becomes, so A becomes a 1 here. And because B is a 1, and so that would become a 1. 1 and 1, so that would be a 1. So K down here, these are 0, so that's no good. And then here we've got a 1 for B. Because this is a 1, that would turn to 0, so that would have to be a 0 as well. Okay, so we should have a 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. And that would get you 4 marks. Nice and easy. Practice these, they are really easy. And they've made them even more easy. What I've noticed in the last few papers, certainly since I've taken out the pre-release, that they're only using NOT gates, AND gates, and OR gates. They're not using NAND gates or XOR gates, or it's very rare. Okay, so they've made this easier. Just to get some practice in. Question 8. A programmer is designing an algorithm to calculate the cost of a length of rope. Okay, length of rope. The program requires requirements are input two values the length of the rope in meters yeah l 
and the cost of one meter. Okay, perform a validation check on the length to ensure that the value is between 0 0.5 and 6. Okay, inclusive. Calculate the price. Output the price rounded to two decimal places. Use of the variable name given. State the name of the validation check. Okay, because it's between 0 0.5 and 6, this is what we call a range. Okay, so state it's going to be a range check. Okay, for one mark, it's a range check. It can't be anything else, it's going to be a range check. What do we need to do here? Input two values. So we're going to, first of all, we need to remember what our boxes mean. Yeah, we've got this, we've got diamonds, and we've got just regular, like so. So these, the diamond is a decision. This is just a general process. And these are input, output. Okay, let's have a little look. I've got my gap over here. So what am I gonna do first? Input two values. So first of all, the rope. So let's come down here. I'm open going for rope. Input length. Okay. And then input length and the cost. Cost. But before I do that, in, um, perform a validation check of length. So before we put the cost in, let's put the validation check. Okay. So is length greater than 0 0.5 and less than or equal to 6.0. Sorry, I've missed something out. Greater than or equal to 0 0.5 and less than or equal to 6. Okay. Question mark. So this is a decision. Yeah. So is that going to be a yes or no? Okay. If it's yes, carry on. If no, we're going to go right back to the beginning. Okay. So if yes, though, what we're going to do next, we're going to input the cost. Input cost. Okay. And remember, this is an input, so it's going to be this sort of shape. Yeah. So we've input the cost. We've done a validation check, a range check on the um, length. Now we've got to calculate the price. So price, yeah, is going to equal the length. Okay. Whatever's been inputted by the person times cost. Okay. Now this is just a process. So I'm just going to put that as a square box. Okay. And then what do we do? Output price rounded to two decimal places. Let's output price. So I'm going to put it as a word, put it as a word price, comma. And then I should be able to put whatever the price is, comma two for two decimal places. So price round. In fact, what I could do price equals comma round price two. Okay. Now we don't know what we've not, they've not given us any in terms of a pound sign or a dollar sign or anything. So I'm just going to leave that as a, as a, as a number. Okay. And of course that is, that is going to be an output. So we're using this box here. So let's put that in like that. And that would be our very rough flow chart. Okay. But try and remember these symbols. Okay. With these, will, you've, you can guarantee that they will come up. For part C, give two sets of test data for this algorithm and state the purpose of each set. Well, because we're entering numbers into this I for the length, also for the cost, and we've mentioned range check before in, in terms of values between 0 0.5 and um, 6.0, so that's our range, we could do with something like a boundary, boundary data, test, test algorithms, limits in terms of equaling end and start of length range. I'll put e.g. 0 0.5 and 6.0. So that will be the data. Set two, we could have abnormal data. We could have also have normal data. But abnormal data make sure algorithm rejects values greater than 6.0.
and less than 0 0.5. Okay, we can also say make sure it's a, a numeric value. So a normal data would include a non numeric value within that range. So that's C for marks. D for three marks, complete the headings for the trace table. So if you're going to use a trace table just to make sure it works, to show a dry run for the algorithm, you do not need to trace the algorithm. Okay, well, if I put the algorithm back in, we can see that we, what we need to be looking at are the variables. So to use a variable length, because this is going to be where we're going to put test data. We're also going to use cost, because this is a constant in terms of cost per meter. So we're going to use a variable length and constant cost. When we multiply both of these together, we would get price. And to finish off, we would do an output. So what would be outputted? Based on these variables, constants, calculations, what would be the output? OK, and that's three marks. Describe an improvement that should be made to the requirements of the algorithm. So what could we do? We validated length using a range check. What other range checks could we use, or what other types of checks could we use? We could validate cost, cost to ensure it is a numeric value, or simply use a presence check to ensure a value has been entered. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. Validate cost. Just thinking, uh, for me, I think that would do. So that was question eight complete. Question nine, ah, we've finally got a database question. A model shop is for five marks, okay? A model shop wants to set up a database to help with stock control of the model figures available for sale. The shop wants to store this information about the model figures. Um, we've got five fields, catalog number, which looks to me like a, um, a unique field. The description, for example, small white dog, the number in stock, for example, five, the price of each model, if the model has already been painted, yes or no. Okay, so we need to work out different names for these. The shop needs five fields for each record. So field one would be um, cat num, okay, cat num, okay, for example, this would be a text slash alpha numeric. And possibly because of its uniqueness, I would say that would be the primary key, okay? Because it's unique. Um, description, for example, small white dog description. So you could just put in there this description, okay? And the data type for that again would be text. I don't know whether you would you would get by by just either writing alphanumeric or just writing text, but I always put both in because that is the name of of, of the data type. Field three, number in stock. Okay, and I'm going to put num stock. Okay, and that would be because it's um, a whole number, that would be an integer. Okay, field four, the price of each model. So simply price. And price would be because it's decimal, that would be a real number. And field five, yes or no would simply be um, a Boolean. And what's it saying? Painted, painted. So just painted. Okay. So I've got cat number, description, num stock, price, painted. Okay, would be my five. Okay, give the name of the field that should be used as a primary key. Oh, we've already done it, look. So I'm going to put in the cat num. State why this field is used as a primary key. It is unique. Unique identifier. Okay, is what we always put in there. Okay, so now we have a, a little bit of, of SQL, uh, Structured Query Language, is used to query the data stored in the database. State what these, oh, wow, well, okay. State what each of these SQL commands are used for. Select, select would list fields that are to be displayed. From, which table is to be used, table. Um, where this identifies the search criteria, okay? E.g. where painted equals yes, okay? Okay, so that is C. So there's a nice little, so there's a nice little 10 mark question to end about databases. 
But that is it. That's the end of this paper all the way up to the 15 mark coding question, which I'll move on to in the next video. So thank you very much indeed for watching, and I will see you next time. Thank you. Please continue to ask questions, leave your comments, hit notifications, and please subscribe. And finally, if you wish to buy me a coffee, I would be truly grateful. Please visit buymeacoffee.com forward slash learning zone. Thank you very much indeed. See you next time. Bye for now.